Let's go back to chapter 12 in John's gospel because we want to continue on that uh, thought, the theme of loving Jesus. What does that look like? Well, I think uh, it becomes very clear in this 12th chapter and uh, the first seven verses. I'm just going to quick read that. You can follow in your Bible if you would. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there they made him a supper. And Martha served, wouldn't you know it. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly. And she anointed the feet of Jesus. She wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag, the treasure's bag, and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but you, but me, you have not always. So what is pictured here is a feast. It's a, it's a dinner, and it's held in Jesus' honor. But also, there is in this a shining example of what we might call extravagant love for Jesus. What does, I mean, all-out love for him look like? We're going to see it here. This instance, this event, it must have brought joy and comfort to Jesus, especially because he was about to experience the cross. And here he is enjoying the love that is expressed by one of his followers, while at the same time, the Jewish leaders had stirred up the multitudes and they hated Jesus and they were looking for a way to kill him. And uh, this must have been one of the most moving times in Jesus' earthly life. I really think it was. Normally, uh, what would happen if you were the guest at uh, someone's home like this, uh, they would uh, not only offer to have servants wash your feet, or you would wash your own feet, and the, that would all be provided but normally also they would sprinkle a few drops of olive oil that had been perfumed with some fragrant herbs or spices that really didn't cost the, the host very much. And that would be put on the, on the head of each guest. That would be like a welcome and uh, it would show respect for that guest and, and it also would be refreshing. What Mary did. She took this perfume called nard and she poured out the entire contents of a jar that she broke. She poured out the, the entire contents of this most expensive perfume in all the world on Jesus' feet. It was the kind of perfume that was only used by royalty or by very rich people uh, because. This one little bottle was the equal of an average worker's annual wages, a year's worth of work to purchase this. And so in this moment of impulsive love on the part of Mary, it seems pouring it on his feet, like, you know, there's no apparent usefulness in that. And so you have three different viewpoints in this incident regarding what Mary did. You have the disciples, the 12, you have their viewpoint, you have Mary's viewpoint, and then you have Jesus's. And I want to just uh, briefly look at each one of them. And let's think about this and uh, let's see where we land. But the first one is the viewpoint of the disciples regarding this thing that Mary did. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you use this time to really show us what loving Jesus looks like, uh, that we might really understand that uh, you're worth whatever it is, our whole lives poured out like this for you. We just thank you for this event that is uh, pictured here, recorded for us. Challenge our hearts by it and really use it in our lives this afternoon to teach us more about what it means to really love you. Lord, we love you. Uh, we say that. Lord, we want to prove it by the pouring out of whatever our entire lives to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the fifth verse of John 12, you have Simon, or rather uh, Judas Iscariot, and he's speaking for the 12 disciples. But he's not alone in his assessment and his uh, viewpoint, because in a parallel in Mark chapter 14 and verse 4, we have a, another look at this same incident. And it says, and there were some that had indignation within themselves. So it was more than Judas. It was other of the disciples, perhaps all of them, that felt this way. They felt that she had been too lavish by pouring out this very expensive perfume on Jesus' feet of all places. Not on his head, on his feet. Why would she be so over the top when just a couple of drops would have sufficed? They were looking at it, I think, as we often do, uh, looking at it as a matter of profit and loss. Uh, as a business proposition, Judas expresses, he said, you know, that same ointment could have been sold for market value, and we could have used that then to disperse money to people that really have need. Sounds good. Sounds really pious. Here's a warning. Be careful not to be like these disciples. Be careful not to be stingy in giving anything to the Lord. Don't be stingy and cheat the Lord of time, your time, because it really is his. Don't be stingy in giving the Lord whatever gifts he gives you, whatever talents he blesses you with. Don't be stingy in giving whatever possessions the Lord puts his finger on in your life to him, to his work. I really believe from what takes place here that the Lord Jesus, his heart aches for this kind of lavish, extravagant love. And it must hurt him when that's absent. And I don't think he gets that very often from very many of his people. They say it's lavish. In fact, in that same uh, parallel verse, Mark 14, 4, here's what the these uh, some of them say. Why was this waste of the ointment made? They not only said this is way over the top, much too lavish to take that expensive perfume and pour it on Jesus' feet. We can find better uh, uses for it. This is not only lavish, here they say it's a waste. Now think about that. Is there anything that you can give to the Lord that he would call a waste? Especially something like this that is so valuable. They're saying, why not do something useful with the money? It's worth so much. You know how much that, that perfume would bring on the market? So let's be practical. Let, let's think of, of some good that it might be able to accomplish if we got the money for it. How many people's needs would be met? Here's a warning. Don't let other people's assessment or viewpoint hinder you in any way from pouring out your life or whatever the Lord wants you to on his behalf. 
don't be stopped by other people's opinions or other people's viewpoint. I remember uh, my dad, when he was working his way through college, he was a milkman. He worked for what was then called the Borden Dairy. Remember Borden Milk? Borden uh, was a, a wealthy American family. And uh, one of the Borden sons, I mean, the, 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 the father that built this empire, one of his sons got saved. And uh, he went to Yale University and trained, you know, to step into the business and, and uh, take it to the next level after his dad to turn it over to him. But he got saved. And as a result of the Spirit of God moving on the hearts of many young people, many college students during that, uh, that uh, particular period in our history, he decided to step away from all of that and to give his life to be a missionary. He was going to be a missionary to Muslims. Uh, he was going to learn the Arabic language. And um, so he took his inheritance and he gave it away to the Lord's work. He gave it to mission agencies and uh, got rid of all of that. And then he got on a boat and he made his way to Egypt to study Arabic. And he got there and it wasn't very long. He caught a deadly disease. I don't remember if it was meningitis, you know, in his brain or whatever, but it didn't last long and he died. And everyone thought, wow, what a waste. Here's this young man. He had all of that money and all of that potential. And look at what he could have done with his, even as a Christian, he could have, he could have built that business bigger and he could have given so much to you know, the Lord's work. However, that's not how God saw it. This young man, um, it's called, there's a biography called Borden of Yale. I don't know if you've ever read it. I read it many years ago. It's a, it's an excellent, uh, story of this young, that biography was used by God to literally influence thousands of young people and point them toward missions. And much missions work has been accomplished as a result of this young man, Borden. So question, are you wasteful and extravagant spending for yourself or extravagant and so-called wasteful in spending yourself out of love for the Lord, or are you stingy in what you give to the Lord? It begins by giving yourself. That's the viewpoint of the disciples. The second viewpoint is that is Mary herself in chapter 12, verse 3, where we see her action, where she takes this expensive uh, amount of Nard, this perfume, uh, again, in the, in the 14th chapter of, of Mark, it says that the perfume was in what was called an alabaster box. And it says she broke the box and poured it on his head. So she destroyed the container so that the whole amount of that perfume had to be poured out. Now, Mark says she poured it on his head. John says that she poured it on his feet. And the fact of the matter is she poured it on his feet and his head from head to toe. She took that, that uh, perfume, that expensive perfume to her. It was not extravagant, overly lavish. It was not a waste to Mary. Her viewpoint was this was an act of worship. This was her way of really worshiping the Lord. This was a pinnacle moment in the life of this woman in that she was able to publicly acknowledge her pure love for the Lord Jesus. It was, I think, a spontaneous thing. It was a self-forgetful thing, a self-forgetful love that must have brought great joy to her to, as they said, waste this on Jesus because she just dearly loved him. So it was worship to her. 
It reminds me of another missionary story that I read recently about a an elderly uh, or middle aged rather uh, missionary woman who who had to come home from the mission field because she was in four missions, but she developed cancer. She came home uh, for treatments, and her daughter had been called to the mission field as well and was just about ready to depart when her mom uh, was diagnosed with this cancer. And of course, her daughter wanted to stay and, and nurse her and to be at her side. And yet the mother said to her daughter, look, I want you to pour out the aroma of your life where people need it. God will take care of me. You are going to head out to the mission field. You don't have to stay and, and, and nurse me. And she let her daughter go rather than selfishly holding her daughter back. That, to me, is also an act of worship on the part of that mother and daughter. But there's another viewpoint, I think, that, that Mary says, not only that this was worship to her, but this involves stewardship on her part. That perfume was something that in that day would be a prized possession. And normally it was used by people that had it to draw attention to themselves. Well, you smell good. You smell really good. You really smell expensive, uh, this expensive perfume. But instead, she's using this that God had allowed her to have. I don't know how she obtained it. I don't know if she inherited it from her, her mother or a rich friend gave it to her. I don't know. We're not told. But she decided that she was going to use it not for herself, to draw attention to herself and just uh, hoard it. And, uh, you know, but rather she was going to use it as a gift to the Lord. And I guess the question is this. Your life and everything that God puts in your life is a stewardship. It doesn't belong to you. You don't own it. You don't own yourself. You're bought with a price. You don't own anything that you possess. It's all God that provides whatever we are, whatever we have. And so the question is, are we using the gifts that God gives us for ourselves, Or are we rather pouring it out at Jesus's feet? You know, if she had only poured out a few drops on Jesus, there'd be no story to pass on that we're looking at. There'd be no story to pass on. And uh, there, there'd be no stimulation to express a love for Jesus that, of course, means so much to him. We have a lot to thank the Lord for this lady because of her stewardship that she expressed toward the Lord. And then, and probably most importantly, in the seventh and eighth verse of this uh, chapter in John 12, <clears throat> we have the viewpoint of Jesus. What does he think about this? Because that's what matters the most. Doesn't matter what people think. And it matters to some degree what you think. But what really matters, what is Jesus? What's Jesus' viewpoint? And by the way, you know, if you're disturbed by what people think or by what people say, God can't use you. You got to have thicker skin than that. And uh, if you don't, you'll never amount to anything useful to the Lord. You can't allow people's attitude towards you, people's words against you, people to offend you. If you wear your feelings on your sleeve and you're easily offended, guess what? you're really not going to amount to any usefulness to the Lord. So learn that. Young people, learn that early. Uh, don't be so sensitive. If you are, ask the Lord to give you grace to be able to handle whatever it is that's put in your, you know, in your lap, so to speak, so that you can, you can deal with it God's way with grace. He gives grace. It's called grace. It, it, it will strengthen you. God's grace will enable you to handle whatever gets thrown at you, whether it's nice or not. So that's free. Let's look at Jesus' viewpoint here. What does he say? In verse 7, Jesus said, let her alone. 
I don't know how he said it. That's how I would have said it. Leave her alone. Uh, he said, let her alone. Uh, basically, he says, why are you bothering her? What's Jesus' viewpoint? Well, the first thing he does is he rebukes Judas Iscariot and the other disciples that are upset and indignant that this waste is made. Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? They get they rebuked her. Jesus rebukes them just as sharply. Not only that, very clearly, Jesus not only rebuked, but he received what was given him by Mary. In fact, he says, Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you. But me, ye have not always. So, you know, have you ever thought about this, that in some ways God is not so economical and utilitarian about matters of the heart, of, about matters because of the heart? You can't measure the heart. And uh, you can't measure it in dollars. There's sometimes... You know, for this is not a very good example, but it just came to my mind. You know, when we first came here, uh, we had no money. Uh, we certainly, we couldn't even put, we couldn't get a loan to my house or even put a down payment. So obviously we rented. We rented for almost 20 years. And, uh, you know, I, I often... People would say things once in a while, you know, that's not very good stewardship. You know, you could be taking that rent money and you could be buying a house. Um, there's only one problem with that. The Lord hadn't given us the go ahead. The Lord hadn't given us that ability and he, he, it was not his time. It was not what he wanted us to do at that time. And so the fact of the matter is sometimes God isn't as economical and as utilitarian as we might think he should be. And the reason is, is because when it comes to matters of the heart, doing what you believe is the will of God, that can't be measured in dollars. Jesus longs for hearts like Mary's. That is a heart that personally expresses this self-forgetful love for him. Mark chapter 14, again, verse 8, Jesus says this about her. She hath done what she could. She hath done what she could. There are many things that women could not do, especially in that culture. She hath done what she could. She was incapable of doing some things, but she did something, and it was significant to Jesus. He said, you know what? She has prepared my body for my death. And she did it. Normally, that would be done after the death. She did it while he was alive and able to, right then and there, appreciate it and express his appreciation, which maybe I should say, express your love for Jesus now. Don't wait for some future event because you know what? It may never happen. If God prompts you to do something that is an expression of your love and your submission to him, don't wait for the future. Do it now while you have the opportunity, while the spirit of God has put that desire in your heart. Do it now. You realize the other ladies and the other uh, that wanted to anoint his body, they came, but it was too late. They didn't get that opportunity. He'd already risen. She did it before. And he commends her for that. He receives this kind of, of extravagant love, if you want to call it that, that uh, she was able to do. Third thing, and the final thing, when we look at Jesus' viewpoint of what Mary did, not only did he rebuke, not only did he receive, but also he said that, what she did would be remembered. Verse 9 of John uh, uh, 
of Mark, actually, Mark 14. Here's what uh, Jesus says. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of her for a memorial of her. And here we are over 2,000 years later, right? And we're speaking about it. What's interesting to me is in Jesus' statement there is implicit the fact that he is absolutely confident that the gospel is going to be carried worldwide. Wherever the gospel is goes in this world, he's confident that's going to happen. And the aroma of her broken jar really has reached the world over the last 2,000 years. Mary's extravagant love for Jesus is rebuked by her circle of fellowship. You know, that's sad when your own, when God's people don't get it, when God's people don't understand that what you're doing is worship and love for the Lord that you're, she was rebuked by her own circle of fellowship, but she was welcomed and she refreshed Jesus just before he was going to give the ultimate sacrifice of his own life. So, question in closing. What have you lavished on the Lord? What have you, what extravagant love have you done for Jesus? What have you done for him just out of pure love? Without expecting anything by way of blessing back in return from him. Jesus values that more than all the service that we can give to him because it's the love behind the service that makes it fragrant. Has God been pleased over something that you've done, though maybe others didn't notice it or others weren't pleased by it? 